But just how well does a small block Ford in a Sunbeam Alpine make it run? Pretty good if you ask me. They're exciting cars to drive, but isn't everything with a small block Ford? So how much is one of these worth? Well, if you go to Haggerty.com, we have this handy valuation tool. Values for Mark II Tigers have been relatively flat since 2018, and as of May 2021, a number one concourse condition example is valued at $189,000, and a number two excellent condition example is valued at $137,000. This video review is intended to give an overview of what it's like to buy a Tiger but please keep in mind that values change over time. For even more details and up-to-date information, please click the link below or go to haggerty.com. I am driving a 1960s British Roadster that Carol Shelby and Ken Miles helped figure out how to stuff a small block Ford V8 into it. And you are correct, it is not a Shelby Cobra. In fact, it is a Sunbeam Mark II Tiger. Here's the backstory. The Roots Group in England was building their Alpine Roadster. Very upscale British sports car. Nice wood dash, telescopic steering column, reclining seats, all kinds of stuff that was never seen at the time really in any other small British sports car. But the bad part about the Alpine was it made do with a 1.7 liter four cylinder that, let's face it, was gutless. So the West Coast office of the Roots Group knew they needed help to make the Alpine compete in the American marketplace. They went to Shelby, of course, and they asked him if he could make a prototype of a V8-powered Alpine. Shelby, never one to shy away from adding to his bottom line, said, of course I can do that. For $10,000, I'll build you a running prototype. They hired him. But they also went to Shelby's ace hot shoe and engineer, Ken Miles, who had also been instrumental in the development of the Cobra. And they asked Ken Miles if he could take an Alpine and make a running V8 prototype. He did as well, but for $800. In the end, it was Shelby's $10,000 prototype that gained approval from the Roots Group. The result was this, the Sunbeam Tiger. And a pretty damn good result, if I do say so myself. But the Tiger was not made to win races. The Tiger started with the luxurious Alpine, and they wanted to give it some power, not to make it a race car. But let's say you bought a Tiger, and you did want something with a little more bite. Well, that's where Carroll Shelby helped the Roots Group develop a line of hop-up accessories called Los Angeles Tiger Options, or LAT for short. It was a high-performance catalog, much like Shelby offered for his cars. So if you did want to make a Tiger go fast, you could do it with the LAT options. And many cars have had those added either in period or after the fact because they're still reproduced today. How does the car drive? Well, it's a small British sports car like an MGB with a Ford V8, a Ford top loader, and a Salisbury differential, which is basically a Dana 44. So yeah, these things get down the road pretty well. You can drive it through a parkway like I am at 35 miles an hour, just loafing along, or you can go to the next stoplight and race the guy next to you and probably win. So here we are looking at the Mark II Tiger. The Mark II was the final iteration of the Sunbeam Tiger, which started with the Mark I and then the Mark IA and there were roughly 7,000 Mark I's and Mark I's produced and 534 Mark II's. Early on in the production line with the Mark I's, they had rounded corners on the doors, rounded corners on the hood, they had a solid steel boot cover for the top, and in a cost cutting measure, they went and changed those to square corners on the doors, square corners on the hood, and a soft boot cover, among some other changes. 
So really as time went on, they found ways to make the production more efficient and more cost effective. And the way they produced these cars was after the Roots Group approved the Tiger project, they had Press Steel Industries made the body shell with all the modifications needed for the Tiger. And then Jensen Motors did the final assembly, which leads to a lot of hidden little details to tell a real Tiger from an Alger, which is an Alpine converted to a Tiger. The Sunbeam Tiger Owners Club will be able to inspect a car and give it what they call a tax certification, a Tiger Authenticity Certificate. They look at all these hidden little parts within these cars to tell if it's a real Tiger or a fake Tiger. We've already talked about the rounded versus squared corners on the body panels, which is a way to tell the Mark I from a Mark IA. The Mark IIs, however, lost the body side trim molding of the Mark I cars, gained wheel opening moldings, gained a rocker panel molding, gained chromed headlight bezels, and also an egg crate grill. What this Mark II is missing are the white vinyl side stripes that went along the rocker panel, much like a Shelby GT350 that was a Mark II hallmark. However, the previous owner of this car is the guy who made all the reproduction stripe kits for Mark II Tigers, and he didn't like the way they looked, so he took them off. Now also on this vehicle, it has the LAT optional alloy wheels instead of the factory stamped steel wheels and hubcaps. This car also has the optional factory hardtop, which was available throughout the model line. Mark I, Mark IA, and Mark IIs could all get the optional hardtop. So for you people that are interested in a Tiger and are also Chrysler fans, you'll note there's a single lone Pentastar emblem from the Chrysler Corporation down low on the right front fender. That was because the Chrysler Corporation ended up purchasing the Roots Group. The Roots Group was having a real moral dilemma with having a Ford V8 in one of their Hallmark performance cars. So they just decided the easy way out was to kill the Tiger. So if you see that, that was the death knell for the Sunbeam Tiger. What makes a Tiger a Tiger is obviously what's under the hood. So let's take a look at that. Now the Mark I cars, the 1 and the 1A both had a 260 cubic inch small block Ford with a cast iron intake and a two barrel carburetor. It was 164 horsepower, kind of a low revving power plant, not a hot rod K code like Shelby used in the Cobras and the GT350s, but rather more befitting of a grand touring car such as the Tiger. Now the Mark II is special because they upgraded the power unit to a 289 cubic inch engine. It was still a two barrel on a cast iron intake, but it did away with some other antiquated features of the Mark I cars, such as the generator became an alternator and other little detailed changes that went along with the advancements in production. This particular Mark II has a host of LAT options under the hood, because when you add a good camshaft and a four barrel and the right intake and headers to one of these, you're well above 200 horsepower. But when you add more horsepower, you also add more heat. And even stock Tigers have always had a problem with running hot. Their cooling system is limited in capacity and there's virtually no room for air to move around the engine or to get out of the engine compartment. It's a lot of engine in a very small compartment and the more horsepower you crank out of it, the more you're gonna be worried about your cooling system problems. So this is the egg crate grill of the Mark II and it should be noted on this car that the original owner added these Lucas driving lights as well. So these are not an original factory Tiger item. The egg crate grill is the most easily identifiable way to tell a Mark II from a Mark I where the Mark I just has a single grill bar going across the middle of the opening. This has the Ferrari-esque or even Cobra-esque egg crate grill fitted to them. One of the critical things to check on a Tiger when you're thinking about buying one are the original tags under the hood. So you wanna make sure that the chassis tag and the body tag are in place and original. And one of the things that the Tiger Club will look at when they're authenticating a Tiger is the authenticity of these tags and the rivets that hold them to the car. So these unique rivets are one way to know if the tags are original to the car and if they've ever been removed. And the interior of a Tiger is really a luxurious place to hang out when you consider it's an old British Roadster. It's a solid wood dashboard, full instrumentation, a nice shifter for the Ford top loader transmission, a center console, an ashtray even if you're one of those people that still needs one of those, uh, niceties such as a glove box light and even a telescopic steering wheel, which you loosen the center and you can move it back and forth, just like that. Another interesting feature are the fully adjustable and reclining seat backs. And also the seats are height adjustable as well. There's a little bar underneath the seat where if you're shorter, you can flip it up 
put the seat back down and you gain about an inch and a half of seat height. Just shows you they were thinking ahead when they designed the Tiger on the inside. This particular Tiger again has another LAT option which is this radio console and speaker which if you did not get the radio option from LAT there would be nothing here. So all this speaker and radio was all added which is a very rare option and highly sought after by Tiger collectors. Most old British car issues apply to the Sunbeam Tiger as well. If you're used to old car problems you won't be surprised by a Tiger. But overall as you can see the Tiger is certainly a grand touring car on the inside and it, it's just an inviting place to hang out for a while and go for a drive especially when you consider how quickly you can get there with a Ford V8 under the hood. Before we go underneath this Tiger and take a look at the problem areas and what you should look for, let's start on the outside. Like any unibody stamp steel construction car, you really need to pay careful attention to panel gaps and body fit, especially rocker panels and body seams. Look for original spot welds like these. Walk around the whole car and look how everything lines up because if a unibody car takes a hard hit, they're very hard to put right. So be on high alert when looking at any car, especially a Sunbeam Tiger, because of the amount of horsepower and their propensity to rust. These are two things that can really twist up a body shell even without being wrapped around a telephone pole. One thing to look for on a Tiger to tell if it's really a Tiger or if it started life as an Alpine is the location of the electric fuel pump. The Mark I cars have the electric fuel pump mounted where the original battery would have been in an Alpine. The Mark II Tigers move the electric fuel pump into the trunk into the spare tire well. And you can see the lines and the filter coming out of this one. This is where the electric fuel pump is mounted on a Mark II car. If a car didn't start life as a Tiger, or if it didn't start life as a Mark II even, oftentimes you'll see a fuel pump somewhere it shouldn't be. That's a giveaway. So always look at key points. The frame, the cross members, the rocker panels. This is the heart and soul of the car right here. This is what holds it together. This is what makes all that power go to the back without twisting the whole car into a pretzel. So under the car is even more critical. One of the things you look for to see if a Tiger is a real Tiger is how the exhaust is put through this cross member in the frame. The way that these were done at the factory is quite unique. A lot of people have gotten it close when making fakes, but they don't have it perfect. And again, rust and damage, very critical areas inside the sills, the rocker panels, these cross members. Make sure everything's nice and straight and clean. Now, it doesn't have to be concourse perfect and shiny and perfect paint. This is a 34,000 mile car with 34,000 miles of dirt and wear and patina. That tells me it's real when I look at stuff and see the, the signs of age and the signs of use that match up with the mileage. Paint, shine, polished bolts and all that stuff can be superficial. What you really want to look for are the bones. They say if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck, not always. There are a lot of things on these cars that can be doctored up. You can put new floors in and you can run new fuel lines and brake lines and cut new holes in the cross member for exhaust, repair rust and all that kind of stuff, but it takes a real artisan to know exactly how they were built when they were new and how they should look now. And original cars such as this are a great benchmark and a great example to see what you're looking at and how it measures up. A popular modification is to put a limited slip in these. They all came with an open differential and when you start adding horsepower, you need more than that one wheel drive. And again, these cars were fitted with the Ford top loader four speed transmission. This particular car has the LAT scatterproof bell housing, which was also shared with the aftermarket parts for the Cobra. It also has the LAT finned aluminum oil pan on it. Now you'll notice these pretty stainless steel headers. These were added, these were the California Association of Tiger or Cat Club headers that were added to this car. The stock Sunbeam Tiger manifolds are very restrictive and cost a lot of horsepower. So adding a nice set of headers can add 75 to 100 horsepower to the right engine build. So is the Tiger the poor man's Cobra? Yes and no. Yes, because they are far less expensive than a Cobra. But no, because it's not the same kind of car. This is a car that does share the same heritage. It was developed in part by Shelby and Miles. It has a Ford engine and it's a British sports car. But that's where the similarities end. The Tiger is really, again, a grand touring car 
it has a great heater. You could get the hard top that this car has. It has the roll up windows. It's a car that you could buy and drive every day. And when you drove one every day, you got to enjoy the reliability of an understressed small block Ford V8. So rather than call these the poor man's Cobra, I think we should call it the thinking man's Cobra, or perhaps the traveling man's Cobra. Because they do most of what a Cobra can do for a lot less money, in more comfort, they're easier to find, and they're easier to own in a lot of ways. You can use them as, big surprise, a car. Not to mention, you get a car that sounds like this. There's nothing wrong with that.